Good morning. My name is Patty Lofgren. Please open your Bibles to Romans 13, 1 through 7, and follow along with me as I read. It's page number 1762 in the Blue Bible. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended for the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. As our text, our text is a challenging one this morning, I would invite you to pray with me as we open up God's Word together. Heavenly Father, I think about what you say in your Word, where you tell us that these are the ones I look on with favor, those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my Word. Father, may that be true of us today as we open up your scriptures. May we be humble and contrite in spirit, and may we tremble at your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In your time in the scriptures, I'm sure that you've come across the place in Luke's gospel, the well-known story about, uh, from the teaching of Jesus, the, the parable that we know of as the parable of the Good Samaritan. If you know that story, you know that Jesus' parable is all about a compassionate Samaritan who then serves as an illustration of loving our neighbor. But what we sometimes forget and is easy to forget about that passage is that that parable was originally delivered in response to a particular question. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? You see, the questioner wanted Jesus to clarify just how far love for neighbor actually extended. And so in order to justify himself, this man wanted to hear that love actually had its limits. As I thought about that parable this week, I think it's related to our text. Perhaps there's a bit of that self-justifying who is my neighbor spirit in us when we come to a text like Romans 13, verses 1 to 7. 
When the Apostle Paul begins by saying something like, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, our gut reaction might be something like, all of them? New Testament scholar Doug Moo notes that it's only a slight exaggeration to say that the history of the interpretation of Romans 13, 1-7 is the history of attempts to avoid what seems to be its plain meaning. Similarly, in a recent book entitled The Ballot and the Bible, author Caitlin Schess argues that we tend to invoke passages like Romans 13 selectively, depending on the issue or the politician. See, like the man who asked Jesus, who is my neighbor, we might ask Paul, which governing authorities? So turn with me, if you haven't already, to Romans 13. I want us to follow the flow of this text, the flow of this argument. I thought of it this way, if Paul were a musician, we might say that this passage was composed in three movements. There's an ethical exhortation, a theological explanation, and an everyday application. And so we're going to start with that ethical exhortation, which is really the thrust of this passage there in verse 1, which says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. And because of our our understanding of this passage, I think really hinges on this part of the verse, it's worth taking a few minutes to unpack its meaning. Thinking just through the flow of Romans, as he did in chapter 12, Paul now again begins this chapter with a command where he says, be subject to the governing authorities. And notice there in verse 1 that he addresses this command to everyone. Now, we start to think about what does that mean, everyone. Interpreters actually debate whether everyone means, in Paul's mind, all people everywhere, or is he just talking to Christian believers? Now, personally, I think that the command is true for all people, but certainly in a letter written to the church in Rome, this maxim was to be obeyed by all people. Christians. The key verb in this sentence that we have translated into English as be subject to, we know it it, it shows up dozens and dozens of times throughout the New Testament. It's a call for Christians to submit, that is, uh, it's a call for us to acknowledge and to honor the divinely instituted positions of authority that God has ordained for us. We know throughout Scripture that God has instituted order and authority in places like the family, in the marriage relationship, in the workplace, in the church, and here in the case of Romans 13, even within the state. There's even a passage in Luke's Gospel where the Lord Jesus Himself, when He was a boy, was submissive to his parents, Joseph and Mary, same word. So what we see here is the main command in this passage is for everyone to be subject to the governing authorities. Governing authorities. Well, what does that mean? Who is Paul talking about? Verse 3, Paul then gives us another word to help further define who these authorities are. He calls them in verse 3, rulers. Now, Paul's original readers, as they hear this text read aloud, they would have understood that this was a reference to human rulers in positions, in positions of governing authority. I don't know how many of you have brothers and sisters that you grew up with. I'm the oldest of five siblings. There's three boys, two girls. The second oldest then in my family is my sister Gretchen. And I remember as a kid, as firstborns tend to do, uh, whenever I tried to pull rank and uh, 
as the older brother and order my younger sister to do something that I thought she needed to do, my sister Gretchen would always remind me, you're not the boss of me. She says that quite a lot uh, to me still today, right? So, another way to think about that, you're not the boss of me, is to say, well, who made you king? Who put you in charge? And that is a very fair question. And I think it's the question that Paul intended to answer in this passage. You see, this ethical exhortation to be subject to the governing authorities, it has to be rooted in some kind of theological truth, or else Paul's readers are going to have every right to ask, well, who made them king? They're not the boss of me. And so look closer at this explanation in verse 1 and then following and notice that Paul does indeed ground this command by saying, notice verse 1, there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Those statements are two ways of really saying the same thing. Uh, We can state it positively, we can state it negatively. No ruler holds a position of governing authority except that which God has established. And every governing authority that now exists, exists because God has put them in that position. Or we could restate it this way. Every ruler holds his or her governing authority by the sovereign will of God. Now, we have a different perspective, don't we? As human beings, our perspective, we we see that people tend to assume authority and power in one of three general ways. We're most used to that some rulers are elected to their positions. But of course, in our world, others like William, Prince of Wales, he will inherit the throne either upon the death or abdication of his father. Of course, there are other instances where power then is sometimes taken through violence, through acts of insurrection, or military coup. But you see, Scripture, however, tells us that over and above these human means, God's sovereign will guides the rise and fall of every earthly power. Again, every ruler holds his or her governing authority by the sovereign will of God. We see this in Scripture, too, not just in in history, but in the history of God's people. Genesis, we read about a man named Joseph. He was a great-grandson of Abraham. Joseph was, uh, we see that God sovereignly guided him to one of the highest places of power in Egypt, And yet, when that story then continues into the book of Exodus, Scripture tells us about the rise of a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing, who came to power in Egypt. The Old Testament also tells about a man named Daniel who had a firsthand experience with the hand of God guiding the earthly authority of a king. And even though King Nebuchadnezzar was responsible for Daniel's deportation to Babylon, upon reflection, Daniel could say of God that he changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. And so in Romans 13, verse 1, we have this uh, uh, ethical exhortation, and it's followed by that theological explanation. So why should everyone be subject to governing authorities? Answer, because every ruler holds his or her governing authority by the sovereign will of God. God. 
Now, Paul needs to expand on that explanation, and he does so there. You'll notice in verse 2 and following, he says there in verse 2, consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. So the conclusion that Paul reaches there in verse 2 is that opposition to governing authority is opposition to the authority of God. Or we could say an unwillingness to submit to divinely instituted rulers is an unwillingness to submit to God's own rule. Now as we reflect on this principle, we see that the root of this rebellious spirit of course, goes all the way back to Adam and Eve, doesn't it? Their act of opposition to God's authority in the Garden of Eden. Remember when Eve took for herself and for her husband that which God said was off limits, they were effectively saying to God, who are you to tell us what is good and what is evil? Who says we can't determine for ourselves what is good? Who made you king? And that rebellious attitude has passed on then to every generation since, and it resides within our sinful hearts today. I really appreciate the way that author and theologian D.A. Carson describes this nature of our sinful rebellion. He calls it the de-godding of God. That's always stuck with me, the de-godding of God. He says it this way, if God makes image bearers and pronounces what is good and what is evil, if he orders the whole system, then to come along at any point and say, no, I will declare my own good. What you declare to be evil, I will declare to be good. What you say is good, I will declare to be evil. This is why the tree bearing this fruit is said to be the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What is crucial is not the tree, but the rebellion. He says, what is so wretchedly tragic is that God's image bearer standing over against God. This is, is what he says, the de-godding of God so that I can be my own God. This, in short, he says, is idolatry. That's what Paul's getting at here in verse 2. Paul says in verse 2, Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Again, opposition to governing authority is opposition to the authority of God. And so when we get to verses 3 and 4, Paul then uses a very interesting term to describe those whom God sovereignly places in these positions of authority. Look here at the text, verses 3 and 4, which says, For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong, uh, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Did you catch how Paul describes these these folks in, in authority? He calls them God's servants. God's servants. Now, maybe that's not all that strange to us. We're used to calling governing Uh, officials, uh, public servants. So to describe them as God's servants might not sound all that strange, but, but for those of you maybe reading from the King James this morning, you probably see a different word there. It doesn't say servants. It says ministers. See, servants can also be translated as as ministers. The word servant that Paul uses there, that he chooses, is used elsewhere in the New Testament to describe those who do the work of Christian ministry. In fact, it's a word that's related to uh, the, the office of deacon in a local church context. 
Now, by no means is Paul suggesting that every ruler is doing the work of ministry in the same way that we would say pastors or elders or deacons or Sunday school teachers do ministry. And yet the ministry or the service that God has assigned to these rulers, including secular governing authorities, is the service or ministry of maintaining good social order in the world. You see, their God-given role is to commend or to approve what is good and to judge and punish wrongdoing. And so Paul goes on then to say, do what is right and you will be commended. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. And so Scripture says that this divinely instituted ministry of the state, as Pastor John Stott puts it, is to promote and reward the good to restrain and punish evil. Or again, if we restate it, that God has ordained for the state to promote human flourishing and administer His justice. Therefore, Paul reiterates in verse 5, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. And then Paul gives two reasons here why it's not only wise to submit to the governing authorities, but it's also the right thing to do. He says, first, since God has ordained and authorized the state to promote human flourishing and administer His justice, it's best not to be on the pointy end of the sword. But second here, the real fundamental reason why submission to the state is necessary is that it's a matter of conscience. What, what Paul says here really goes back to verse 2, that all people, and in particular God's people, must not reject the divinely instituted social order that God has put into place for our good. And when we start to apply this principle... We recognize there's a number of ways that we can apply this command to everyday life. What Paul does is he chooses this application of the payment of taxes as one practical application of such submission. Now, whether we apply this text to the paying of our taxes this spring or as Paul, you notice, expands there in verse 7 by giving proper respect and honor to whom it is due, the, the principle remains the same, that submission to the governing authorities God has ordained is ultimately an act of submission to the authority of God. Now, we've gotten this far into the text, and we've worked our way through it, and before we come to the end we probably need to address the obvious concern that most people have with this passage. How are God's people to obey His Word and submit to the governing authorities in cases where the governing authorities are promoting what is evil? Are there situations where Romans 13, 1 to 7 no longer applies. When does submission equal sin? Now, the answer to those questions really requires us to pursue wisdom, discernment, and much humility. Again, we we turn to all of Scripture for an answer, and we see that without a doubt, there is a pattern in Scripture where obedience to the will of God requires believers to act in disobedience to the sinful demands of an earthly ruler. Remember the story from the book of Daniel of the three godly men who refused to obey their king's edict 
to engage in idolatrous worship. That Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar asked these men, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I have set up? If you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. And what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. The book of Acts similarly speaks about a time when the followers of Jesus were confronted for preaching the gospel. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. So by no means is Romans 13, 1 to 7, uh, telling us to submit to the governing authorities uh, that that's a requirement for Christians to abandon all godly discernment and to adopt always an unqualified position of obedience to the state. Certainly not. In the hierarchy of authority, God's ways always reign supreme. However, with that qualification in mind, as we approach this text today, we need to be aware of a potentially dangerous underlying attitude in our hearts. As was the case with the man who sought to justify himself asking Jesus, who is my neighbor? We need to be careful not to come to Romans 13, 1 to 7, seeking to justify ourselves by asking which governing authorities. Because as shocking as it might have been to hear that the compassionate individual in Jesus' famous parable was a Samaritan, perhaps today we find it equally unbelievable that God might raise up a leader for his purposes from an opposing political party. Are we willing to follow Romans 13 and be subject to the governing authorities only as long as our team wins? And should the wrong candidates get elected this November, does that mean I need to live in fear of what they might do to the cause of Christ? Or might God be calling me to live by faith and to trust Him that there is no authority except that which God has established? The point being here that our sovereign God can and does use sinful rulers to serve His eternal purposes. And that may be a hard one for us to fully fathom, but God can and does use sinful rulers to serve his eternal purposes. I want to close by looking at two prayers from Scripture. One comes to us from the Old Testament. One comes to us from the New. The prophet Habakkuk lived during a time of national moral corruption and the threat of international violence. And so things did not look good for God's people. And so this prophet turns to God in prayer, a prayer of lament, and he says, How long, Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen or cry out to you. Violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Injustice. 
Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. And God answers him. And God says, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. I'm raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are a feared and dreaded people. They are a law to themselves and promote their own honor. I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe, God says. Of course, many years later, not long after the first Pentecost, the newly formed church was also under pressure from the local authorities. The same rulers who were responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus now was turning their attention to silencing Jesus' disciples. And so in Acts chapter 4, we read about how the church responded to those threats. They prayed, Sovereign Lord, they said, You made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against His anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, Consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Folks, in light of all that we're seeing in Scripture here, no matter who holds a position of power, we can rest in the fact that our sovereign God can and does use sinful rulers to serve His eternal purposes. Our God is sovereign. Would you pray with me? Father, this is a text that is simple and yet complicated. It's not hard to see what you are saying in your word. But Father, sometimes it's hard for us to know how to apply it. So again, Father, I ask that you would give us wisdom, that you'd give us discernment, you'd give us humility. Lord, especially in our nation and in our culture where these concerns over who's in power and how they got there, Lord, that we would rest in the fact that you are sovereign. There will be times when we don't understand and times when we will clearly see your hand at work. But regardless of who and when and how, the fact remains that you are sovereign and may we rest in that truth. God, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.